Kura tātou, nā mihi nui ki a koutou, pai ki te ki te ea koutou, te rangi, te whenua, te iwi, te whare, tēnā koutou. Uh, I'm Professor Nick Draper, I'm a lecturer at the University of Canterbury and I'm absolutely delighted to be part of the Otago Brain Week and my presentation today is about measuring collisions in junior rugby and looking specifically at whether we can make uh, rugby safer for children. I'm going to start this presentation with uh, a couple of video clips because rugby is our national game and I thought it was really nice to look at rugby in terms of how it flows at the elite level and, and, and who better to start with than Christian Cullen as one of our famous All Blacks. Now Marshall, big gap up the middle. Spencer. Zinzan, Marshall, Cullen, Umanga, Umanga is there, gets it clearly, then finds Cullen with a beautiful pass, now they're lining up to score this one, Cullen might do it himself, yes he will, superb, Little feeds it up to Cullen, Still going, 22 metre line. And away he goes. Mertens, Cullen gets up and Cullen's in. Back for Mertens. A Ronnie Clark, lovely ball to Cullen. Christian Cullen, he's there. Carl Hoft again plays halfback. Now Mertens. And a little kick forward for Cullen, here's the adversary, Christian Cullen. When we look at rugby, it's a, it's a fabulous team game and has some wonderful things that it offers for both adult players, but also importantly for children as they're growing up and want to take part in sports and activities and also be part of a team. My presentation today will uh, look at a, we'll go through a number of stages, but we're going to start by looking at rugby at its best and then we'll tr and have a look at some of the research that's around collisions. And then once we've done that, look at that background, we'll then start to look at um, some of the things that rugby is doing and we're also looking at in regard to our research in regards to trying to make rugby safer. So this is a try from uh, back in the 70s. And probably one of the, the real reasons that I grew to love rugby in terms of sort of watching rugby and involvement in the game. And when I was at university, we used to recreate this try out on the paddocks and could do the commentary off by heart. But it's a wonderful example of running rugby and amazing to see behind the back passes and all those sort of one-handed passes going on back in the 70s and things that are still uh, as exciting today in, to watch in the modern game. John Pullen, England's captain, the hooker. McBride trying to get Wilkinson going. Williams again. Everyone with him. Sid going. Very little support. Good tackle by Slackery of Ireland. Almost on the halfway line, Kirkpatrick to Williams. This is great stuff. Phil Bennett covering. Chased by Alistair Scull. Brilliant. Oh, that's brilliant. John Williams. Brian Williams. Pullin. John Dawes. Great dummy. David, Tom David. The halfway line. Brilliant by Quinnell. If the greatest writer of the written word would have written that story, no one would have believed it. That really was something. 
So when we look at rugby and look at the exciting parts of rugby, it, it offers a lot in regard to the sort of free-flowing game and the excitement of matches, and then also that sort of being part of a team and the roles for different players of different shapes and sizes, and also that whole thing of the, the wonderful Saturday mornings at rugby clubs around the country where uh, players go in and they play their game and then they stop after the game and they have their morning tea or... Um, break and teat little prizes and things like that and everybody feels you know there's been a, a fantastic way to spend a, a sunny winter's morning on the other side of that though we have some issues that have been highlighted in research recently so many people may have seen the film um, concussion and some of the related research associated with um, that film and that has raised questions such that newspapers have got sort of headlines more recently around in the UK whether rugby should be banned uh, from schools or tackling rugby should be banned from schools and should there be some sort of age limit in regards to when people start to tackle. And other headlines have highlighted um, the recent lawsuit that has come as a class action against World well, Rugby and British uh, or English RFU, and also then sort of issues around children and, and concussion and, and linking into possibly lifelong uh, health problems. But the evidence isn't absolutely clear cut, so that there's some really key aspects of the research and anything that involves trauma and, and suffering for somebody is, is to be avoided you know, at all costs if we can. But when we look at the evidence, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty in terms of whether the data is there in regard to causal effects and what that looks like for um, us as research and understanding issues around concussion and their effect on people's lives. When we look at some of the early studies around CTE, which identified these crystals within the brain and suggested that there was a long-term effect of collisions on a player's health, other studies around a similar sort of time have not been able to find the same effect. So we can look at each of one of these studies that we're highlighting, and they weren't able to replicate the same findings that they'd had previously. So I guess the key message in that is that we need more research in order to understand these problems more clearly. And we also need to understand the problems really clearly as well, so that um, there's been calls for tackle rugby not to be started in younger children. But when we look at data from ACC claims and injuries and concussion, we see that actually in younger children, the, the number of claims and the number of concussions that result in hospitaliz hospitalisation and so on are actually relatively small in younger age groups. So it may be that in those age groups, it's that, it, tackling and concussion are not as prevalent and as serious as perhaps headlines would suggest. However, there are cases there, and I'm sure people know of those in, in children. But what we also know from research is that we learn skills much more readily and much more easily when we're younger than we do when we're older. So it's far easier to learn to ski when you're a child than it is when you're an adult. So if children learn to tackle when they're younger, that actually may be preventative rather than putting them more at risk. And the data in terms of ACC figures would suggest that that's potentially the case. And then in terms of um, reports of ED, emergency department admissions, and presenting with head injuries, what we see, whilst there's, there's clearly a concern around rugby, and that's, that's been in the headlines for very real reasons, um, we also see that things like cycling, skateboarding, horse riding present more, have more cases in terms of um, reporting to EDs than rugby and other sports. So we have to sort of understand prevalence rates um, as well in terms of interpreting the data that we find. Those things being said, um, we as a research team, we start with a focus on junior rugby. And our, our main aim in terms of the research and focus is around trying to make the game as safe as possible for young players. But we start with a passion for the game because we can see some of those really positive benefits of. So what can we do as researchers? What can we do as parents and so on to make the game as safe as possible for junior players? It's really clear, however, that we need further research around the nature of collisions and Clearly collisions with the head are not beneficial for any players involved in them. 
However, we're still looking for um, further information and evidence. And while we're looking for that evidence and understanding, particularly things like subconcussive knocks, which have been talked about more recently, while we're looking for more evidence and data about that, our focus as a research group is around can we make rugby safer? And when you look at Richie McCaw's comment, then you could, you know, that you can look at that and read that in regard to, well, this, there is some collision involved in it, but there's a player that played for many years and absolutely loved the game and enjoyed that physicality within the game. The first thing we'll look at before we look at our research and what we've been doing, I think it's really important to recognise that World Rugby and New Zealand Rugby have made significant efforts in regard to changes in the rules that make the game safer. So that video clip of the Barbarians shows at least two high tackles, and there's some photo clips um, there in this slide which highlight how many high tackles there were within that clip, but also within the game in previous versions and, and, and prior to the sort of rule changes. But World Rugby and New Zealand Rugby, in an attempt to make the game safer, have started to change things around shoulder, shoulder charges, the height of tackles, and also then looking at around the clean out and the breakdown in terms of changing rules. And there are more rules put in place this year which will, ad which will address those kinds of issues. So the first thing that rugby can do in terms of making the game safer is changes in the rules. Similarly, there's uh, been great attention to stand down periods for players and that use of those within the game within New Zealand has been really good in identifying players, more quickly identifying players with a concussion and then removing them from the game and giving them a chance, players to, a chance to recover before they return to playing, to the game, to playing the game. All of those things are really helpful in regard to looking after the welfare of players. So in terms of our research, we began working and looking in a laboratory, not surprisingly for scientists, and we started by looking at under, trying to understand collisions and trying to understand headgear and whether there was a potential of headgear to sort of protect the head of players. And we looked extensively at different types of headgear and whether there was any protective aspect in regard to the headgear and whether it did offer any uh, protective potential. In order to do that, we built a three metre high drop test rig. And that means that um, we we're able to drop the head form that you can see in this slide and vary the height from which we drop from. It's dropped onto an, a steel anvil or onto an MEP, which is a sort of polyurethane plate, uh, which we put on top of the anvil. We can drop on top of that and we can measure with the sensors inside the head form. We can measure the size of the collision uh, and the impact forces, peak accelerations and so on from any drop that we make from any height up to sort of three meters. There's uh, wires that control that drop so that it drops accurately onto the anvil each time when we um, drop the head form. And in our f one of our early studies, we looked at um, testing different types of headgear. And what you can see from these slides is that these are the original design types of headgear where they were designed to sort of protect from collie ears and from cuts um, during the game. And then more recently, we can see on the left side, the blue and the black headgear are made by a company called Game Breaker. And then on the right hand side is one by, uh, made by N Pro. Now they represent a new generation of headgear where the manufacturers claim that the headgear pro um, provides some sort of protection in regard to mitigating or reducing peak accelerations. And we can see the sort of the, the marketing around the products from those two companies. And when we look at that, the top headgear, so World Rugby, in order to sort of allow these types of headgear in, have moved on from a Law 12, which was around the general specifications for headgear and how it had to be, to the creation of a new law, which is Law 4, which allows headgear to be worn under different specifications as a medical device. And currently, the only headgear that has passed that World Rugby Law specifications is the N Pro headgear, which we can see with the green trim on. That's made in Ireland, and the Game Breaker units are made in the USA. So we imported some of those to test on our drop test rig. And what I'll show you now is just a really quick video that shows the drop test unit in action. From the 
uh, sensors within the head form, we're able to get a reading that looks like this. And what this tells you about is the peak accelerations and then the extent of any bounce or rebound of the head after it first hits the anvil. And we can see that in, represented in the graph with the high peak and then the rebounds and the reverberation being the following part of the signal. When we conducted testing with and without headgear, we had a look at um, head injury criterion score and peak accelerations. And we'll focus in on the peak accelerations because that's about the accelerations at the point of impact on the anvil and is a really good indicator of the forces involved and so we looked at those and we dropped from three different heights so from 238 millimeters through to 912 and we started with a no headgear on condition and then we tested each of the traditional headgears to have a look at those and after that we moved on to look at the newer style headgear and when we look at those results, we can look at the peak accelerations and have an idea of different head positions and so on in terms of uh, different orientations of the head with that. And we can look at the different styles of headgear. When we look at that, when we compare the no headgear um, column, which is the sort of brownie column, we can see that there is some sort of reduction brought about by even traditional headgear which isn't designed to reduce peak accelerations, but significantly more reduction when we talk about the Game Breaker and the N-Pro units. The one that's interesting in, in regards to that is looking at the rear orientation, where we see that the N-Pro unit, which has laces at the back, there's, when you drop to the rear, we see that the score in terms of peak acceleration increases to around the same level as traditional headgear. However, the game breaker units, there's still a peak reduction, that reverse in the rear impact because they have a piece of foam instead of the laces in the back of the headgear unit. So our research really did suggest that there, were, there was some degree of mitigation brought about through these new uh, headgear units. So what we've set about to do, and we're delighted to have funding from the Neurological Foundation to make that happen, is to run a, a proper field study over the next two rugby seasons. So we will use the NPRO headgear because that's the only headgear that has world rugby approval and players can opt into or out of wearing that headgear. The intention is to assess over two seasons, 80 players, under 16 boys, and under 17 girls players, uh, 40 in each season, 20 in each team, and we'll, they'll opt into or opt out of wearing headgear, and also then they'll be tested pre-season and post-season, and also tested if they had a concussion and they're removed from the game, for, or from any match or training, and the pre-season testing will include an MRI scan protocol, neurocognitive testing, and a novel um, virtual reality VR test that we've implemented as well. We'll do that pre and post season, and then obviously post any concussion that a player might receive. In addition, during the season, the players, after they've been fitted for a customized mouth guard, will wear an, a fully instrumented head IQ mouth guard during every training session and every match, and we'll be able to then report, record all the collisions that occur during the games and during training and we'll also video each of the matches so we can verify that the collision was actually a real collision. And we have to do that because sometimes if a player takes the mouth guard out and puts it in their sock, we still, as they run down the pitch, we still get a trace, even though we know the mouth guard's not in their mouth. So we use the video to verify that every collision is a real collision. So we've been really fortunate to receive over a quarter million dollars of funding from Canterbury Medical Research Foundation and importantly the Neurological Foundation and Pacific Radiology Group. Specifically, we have over $100,000 from Canterbury Medical Research Foundation and the focus of their work will be to work with and, and allow us to study the male team. With the Neurological Foundation, it's gonna facilitate us conducting all the research with the female team and Pacific Radiology have given us an in-kind grant which helps us to collect all of the MRI scans. Just a quick mention of the hit IQ mouth guards. 
So this is what the data looks like. So what you can see in terms of that graph is different players and this year we've had the Crusaders and they're, and, and they're continuing to wear these mouth guards during the season and what we have is um, data for different players and then each of those little black lines is a collision that's recorded within the data and the image that you get from each of those collisions is that little peak graph you can see uh, above the um, chart and that peak acceleration is very similar to the one we get within the laboratory and that enables us to compare our head drop in the laboratory with real data from the mouth guards. And we can see some illustrations of the mouth guards and within those, the instrumentation regards, it, it relates to accelerometers and gyroscopes, which allow us to understand accelerations in collisions and changes of speed. Um, and we completed a little while ago, a validation of these units to assess them independently. And they proved to be very accurate in regard to measuring collisions and peak accelerations. So as I'd mentioned, we don't need the players because of the similarity between the mouth guard data and the data within the laboratory. We don't actually need the players to wear headgear during our trial. It would have been very difficult eth ethically to say to one group, you must wear headgear and the other group, you can't wear headgear so we can compare. But we've identified and, and developed a, a, a really novel method to be able to study the collisions without players having to wear headgear. So they'll either opt in to wearing headgear or they'll choose not to wear headgear. And we'll keep a, rec a record of between males and females in regard to sort of how many players wear and don't wear the headgear. So we'll keep that record. But if we have a collision on the field that we need to recreate in the laboratory, we can do that by looking at the field data. And then if the player was wearing headgear, we recreate that signal in the laboratory on our drop test rig with the headgear on. Then we take that off and that enables us to estimate the degree of mitigation brought about by the headgear. Conversely, if a player chooses not to wear headgear, then we'll recreate the collision in the laboratory but without the headgear on. Once we've got those two signals matched, we can then put headgear on, redrop the head form, and from that we'll get the degree of mitigation brought about by the head again. So we've really lucky in terms of this novel method because it means that we can have players carry on playing rugby absolutely naturally like they do either with or without headgear but we can still estimate the degree of mitigation brought about by headgear and then a little side thing in terms of sort of future research for us as a team and we're interested in is we can see the peak accelerations and we can measure with the um, Mouth guards, both peak linear and peak rotational accelerations. We can see the peaks, but what may prove interesting in regard to um, concussion and injury may be this after effect or aftershock that you see. So the, there's an initial collision and then there's a rebound type of effect. And it may be that it's the interaction between this rebound and the peak acceleration that is the more destructive in regard to uh, neural tissue. So one of our future pieces of research is to model the data and have a look at what the effect is on a simulated brain uh, within the laboratory. So we talked about um, the change in and the next generation of headgear. So we've moved over recent times from first generation headgear, which wasn't designed to provide any mitigation, into the new forms N-Pro and Game Breaker, which perhaps we could look at as a second generation of headgear where the manufacturers are making some claims about reduction of peak linear accelerations. And it does appear from our research and other research that's been published around the world that there is some degree of mitigation brought about by the headgear. However, we also know that from other research that's gone on, Liz Williams is a Kiwi working in Wales and research that she did that the um, injuries from collisions are brought about often as well in rugby through peak rotational accelerations. So uh, another aspect of our research in terms of making the game safer is to have a look and see if we can develop a third generation of headgear where it's got some sort of protection mitigation around both peak linear accelerations and rotational accelerations. Then as a researcher, I guess, and as a coach, I'm really interested and I'm involved in uh, coaching rugby for many years, but also involved in and, and taking part in judo. 
So judo as a sport has had quite a, a strong association with rugby and many clubs have used judo coaches to come in and talk to the players and work with the players on the breakdown in particular and how to clear people out and to some extent on tackling and, and sort of movement and so on and within that close quarters kind of uh, contest area around the ball. And that's worked very well for clubs. But the aspect that I was really interested in was falling. And as far as I'm aware, there's no rugby clubs which have used judo coaches in regard to teaching players falling. And I um, had an idea that I'd sort of been percolating for a little while and I phoned a colleague of mine who's at the University of Otago, who's a biomechanist, uh, Mel Busi, and I said, do you think there's something in this video in regard to judo players having something special about how they fall? And if there is, could we test that concept? And is it something that could be teachable um, for coaches or teachable for rugby players um, in the future? So have a look at this video. And what I want you to look at is, these are elite level judo players, but look at the person, not the thrower, which is kind of in the tackling aspect of rugby and how we've used judo in the past. Look at the person being thrown and their control of their head. look at the video of the judo players, the thing that I think is really exciting about it and has some potential in terms of future training for rugby players is to look at the player that's been thrown and to see how they control their heads. So the discussion I had with Mel Busi was around whether we could create a proof of concept in regard to that theory. And if you look at these two videos running now, what we'll see is a rig that Mel has set up in her laboratory at the University of Otago in order to test, in the first case, some uh, normal average people and have a look at how they fall. So those videos show a natural reaction to falling and just what somebody does with their head and how their neck bends and then also that kind of whiplashy effect as they fall onto the ground and onto the mats that were there. Our concept is that judo players fall differently. And we can see um, these little cartoons which show the break falling or the learning to fall process that judo players go through. In previous research regard to rugby in control of the head. Researchers have looked to try and strengthen the neck with the idea that if you strengthen the neck that can be protective to the head in terms of hitting the ground. However, I would argue and suggest that actually just strengthening the neck doesn't mean you're going to control it. 
and actually there's conscious control in the early stages and then autonomous control you develop with skill in terms of control in the head when you land, particularly when it's an unplanned fall. So in judo players, I think we see the ability to control the head in an unplanned fall. And the research line that we would then go down is looking at whether we can take that concept and apply it to rugby. And if so, not only will we coach, which is very well done in terms of the small blacks courses and rugby spark, smart courses, not only will we look at how to tackle, but importantly, we may look at how to be tackled and what do you do as the person being tackled. So in terms of the proof of concept, the first thing we have to look at and we'll do in our laboratory is to look at whether we can compare judo players versus non-judo players and see a difference in terms of control on the head. If there is, then we need to look and see if we can take non-judo players and train them to fall differently. If that's the case, then we can look to see how we develop that into an education package for coaches so that they can teach their young players how to fall and therefore better protect their heads. It's for all of these reasons in terms of the different aspects of our research that we established our research team. In summary, we recognise as a research team that we can't make rugby completely safe, but it's our national game and it's loved by children and adults around New Zealand and it's great if we can look to see if we can help manage that risk and offer potential ways to improve safety within the game. So our focus is, as a research team is on understanding collisions more clearly and then to examine headgear in, and its potential to offer some sort of protection and whether we can take it further in terms of the development. So countries like Japan have headgear as compulsory for all junior players and understanding headgear in more detail through our research will help New Zealand rugby to think about um, rule changes that might follow Japan. Similarly, we also believe that there's a potential there in regard to learning to fall that could be helpful and protective for players for the future. I'd like to thank you all for your um, attention and uh, interest in the presentation today. And of course, the exciting thing about this research is that it's brought together a wonderful team of experts with whom I work on a daily basis in order to deliver all the aspects that we're working on. We're absolutely delighted to have received funding from Neurological Foundation to enable us to study and work with a female team, the Prebleton Under 17 women's team this year. And we have a team of experts, which include mechanical engineers, Natalia Kabulik and Keith Alexander, along with Tim Anderson, Debbie Snell, Samantha Holdsworth and Tracy Melzer, who are our medical neurocognitive team. And then Rich Masters and Mel Busi who are helping some of the, with the, some of the sports science aspects of the research. And Aaron Basu, who's a statistician working on the project, and then Stefan, Nicole and Danian, who are our fabulous PhD students, helping us to collect all the data in our field study this year and next year. And to close, I just wanted to say thank you very much for watching this video and good luck to everybody involved in the Otago Brain Week. Thanks.